Let nice. me tell you a story about okay, okay. Uh, how I discovered this. Okay. I was, it was 2009. Mm -hmm. I was in Brisbane, uh, Brisbane for a community development conference. Mm -hmm. The keynote speaker, Colin Saltmere, uh, an Indigenous man, got up and spoke about Mayuma, his engineering and uh, engineering firm, mm -hmm. uh, civil and construction engineering. Uh, 50 employees, $12 billion turnover at the time. And then he said the words that changed the course of my life. He said, and we're a not-for-profit. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining me, Donny. It's a, like I was saying, your first in-person guest. Um, like I ask all this to our guests, and it's um, wanting to understand like where you come from, your story. So, you know, who is Donny, <laughs> uh, the professor, the person? Uh, yeah, who are you and what's your, your story? Well, I'm passionate about these issues, perhaps from the influence from an early age of, of different perspectives. My father comes from a conservative, wealthy uh, family lineage, and my mother, uh, my father from Sydney and my mother from Melbourne, comes from working class social justice uh, perspectives that sat mm. and still do on different ends of the political spectrum. And so from an early age, I was mm. sitting with that tension that was there. Mm. And I feel like I was able to perhaps witness aspects of both of those sides of, of, of worldviews that had to me pieces that were interesting. It wasn't mm. just oh, my mum, the social justice warrior, has all of the pieces. There were things that my dad would say, even though I disagreed with his economic philosophies, there was things that mm. I, I could see, not just in what he had to offer, but also then in the way that they engaged. Mm. I lived in, I grew up in probably the wealthiest suburb of the Southern Hemisphere in mm. the lower North Shore and in Sydney here. Mm. And from an early age, things just didn't feel right to me about a lot of things. So I remember seeing you know, TVs being thrown away in the streets. So one day I found, uh, maybe I was eight or nine at the time, uh, $12 uh, of US coins just being thrown out in a, in a, in a throw out. And, mm. and it sort of sat with me like, what's going on there? Like that level of largesse that mm. people are throwing away money um, or, you know, TVs that work or, or beautiful items that just they didn't have any use for anymore. And I worked for many years with, with not-for-profit organizations in my teenage years and, uh, and worked with Sydney's Homeless for three years and worked as a telephone counselor um, uh, for another three years with Lifeline and then spent 10 years working with the Fred Hollows Foundation um, as well as work in refugee um, issues mm. and also on native title um, matters with... Uh, Australians for Native Title and Reconciliation. And I think that what I was feeling throughout this time um, is, is maybe I would describe it as uh, systems feeling sure. uh, rather than systems thinking. Mm. Um, things just didn't feel quite right. I remember mm. seeing the, the parents, as I would walk to school many days and I would see the parents drive past in their big four-wheel drives and then talk about how they were buying a more efficient vehicle Mm. Um, you know, the hybrid this or that. And this is 20, 30 years ago. And um, so the, the early sort of cutting edge yeah. of, of, of hybrid vehicles, for example, and it just didn't add up to me. It was like, yeah, but you're, you're promoting these, these status icons of bigger is better, mm. um, more is better, owning more is better, you know, demonstrating that wealth conspicuously uh, mm. is, uh, is, 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 or inconspicuously is uh, is seen as a virtue, and so I think a lot of that shaped who I am. Mm. Um, definitely traveling as I traveled by myself for eight weeks um, mm. when I was fourteen to to Scandinavia, and that had mm. a big impact. I I was doing some sporting events there, and and just seeing different ways of living, and realizing there were lots of different ways. And then traveling a lot around Australia, I spent probably probably a total of six months just in different parts of this country. Mm. Um, slowly like on foot yeah. on foot often just like yeah. seeing different places and that that influenced me a lot uh, and then yeah. and then the last piece is 
I was studying sports science here at UTS, human movement studies, and mm. and then ended up somehow in a and that's a longer story in, in nanotechnology, <laughs> and the global yeah. impacts of nanotechnology, and realizing that at the heart of all of these mm. decisions was uh, the economy. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, there's a, a few things. I mean, uh, I think a lot of interesting insights come from having tensions from an early age. So my co-host talks about a sort of a similar phenomenon where he had a very conservative father and very like mm. progressive or uh, open-minded mother. Who So he did, he grew up in a Steiner school yes, with conservative right. parents, which he talks about that tension has mm. pulled him in really interesting directions. And likewise, my dad is a, is a liberal or a, a right-leaning voter, whereas my mom's more of a, mm. uh, a anti-establishment sort of figure. And so these tensions sort of pulling us in really right. uh, interesting directions. Um, and I note that, I mean, you had a feeling, and I think it's interesting observing how that sort of shapes the decisions that we make and also the decisions that we, uh, or the paths that we go down. And obviously you've gone down now the path of exploring what is called post-growth, which is, uh, we all post yeah the post growth institute which is really a, a interesting choice of words I mean uh, beyond growth and we interviewed uh, economist Timothy Parikh who's a, mm -hmm. one of the degrowth scholars yeah. recently one he's of doing... our post growth fellows actually at the oh, institute wow. yeah. oh fantastic yeah and he's been doing lots of uh, you know publicity now in France I think it's been getting lots of traction but yeah. uh, we just talked about how this idea of post-growth or beyond growth is very uh, polarizing. It's similar to a tension that you probably felt growing up between pulling mm. pulling and pushing between two different areas and other tensions that we feel. So um, I wonder what, how and what you think of uh, the idea of post-growth and perhaps I'd love to get an understanding of what you do at the yeah. Post-Growth Institute. That's interesting what you say about it being polarizing we've not found that with post-growth mm. um, in part perhaps because of the way we frame things and mm. we'll, we'll unpack that in a second mm. um, but even though we don't have the space uh, here to do this experiment in full mm. I want to just walk you through um, an experiment we've been doing for yeah. almost 10 years around the world uh, you might have heard of it or, or seen it where we get people to have a piece of paper and draw a line down the center mm -hmm. And the top right will ask them to draw the write the word uh, future. The top left, they'll write the word present. So you can sort of imagine doing this as we speak it through. Mm -hmm. Then we say, imagine a world, we're going to start on the, the right-hand side. Yeah. Imagine a world that's working for everyone and everything, mm -hmm. human and non-human species. Just mm -hmm. imagine that for a moment, an economy that's working for everyone and everything. Mm -hmm. And then we ask people to drop down into their bodies. How does it feel in that economy? And when they've connected with that feeling, we ask them to draw a symbol or a shape without lifting their pen that represents how it feels in that economy. Mm -hmm. Then we go over to the left-hand side. How does the present economy feel? Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is that no matter where we do this throughout the world, mm -hmm. with demographics across the gender spectrum, age, political background, wealth, I've done this with Fortune 500 executives, I've done this with... Uh, anarchists, mm. the whole lot, it doesn't matter. People will consistently draw one of four symbols or shapes for the future and one of four symbols or shapes for the present or a close variation um, in the vast, vast majority. Mm. So for the future, people will typically draw a circle, an infinity symbol, mm -hmm. a spiral or a heart. All right, that's the future that's working. Mm. For the present, they'll draw a jagged line, a triangle, a downward arrow, or a mess of lines. <laughs> With incredible consistency. Yeah. What this tells me, because the primary difference I see there is people draw something that's non-linear for the future and linear for the present. Mm. Even the most, even the greatest aficionados of our current economy mm. will draw these things and not draw anything circular for the present. So they'll recognize there's something that we need to get to to be sustainable. Mm. Post-growth then says, right, post-growth is a non-linear system. It's not seeking to have that linearity. Mm. Ah, we all actually know 
we need a post-growth system. It's You just drew it. You just identified with it. Mm. And you've just drawn something linear on the left-hand side. Mm. So for us, the entry point is recognizing that everyone actually already has that wisdom in their bodies. So then it comes to how we frame things. And that's where we take a different approach to most in the world, including our colleagues mm. uh, in different post-growth and degrowth spaces. We begin with what's working and how do we accelerate those pieces rather than what's wrong and how do we fix it. Sure. And that opens up a different space for people to engage from a creative neocortex rather mm. than flight, fight, freeze and fawn. Yeah, yeah, and it's also engaging in those more hopeful parts of us that know that when we can imagine things, that's when things can start to change as opposed to, like you said, posing threats to people, which is not the most conducive to, uh, to instigating change of any sort. Um, and I, what I th thought was interesting as well is uh, following the feeling of the current state of society, of economics, and then directly translating that into something that could be uh, imagined, something that can be better. Uh, and uh, I, I would wonder, f from a, if, if I was being critical, there have been areas in my life where I felt very strongly about something, but whether something feels strong and something is necessarily correct or or is better is a separate matter. Do you do, how do you wrestle with the idea that perhaps we feel things can be better and perhaps that's sort of a an an innate sort of sense of wanting things to be better and so we're sort of wondering and thinking well I don't feel great now perhaps there's other alternatives but practically speaking perhaps now is the the best system what would you say to that? Hmm. I would come back to the drawing experiment mm. and the more people get to see that across difference people are drawing that difference uh, between the two different between the present and the future the more we get to see I'm not alone mm. so of course there are going to be there have historically been and will continue to be people who will try to say it's been better than ever yeah I encourage anyone to just feel into their body and go, how does that feel? Does that feel, does that statement feel right? Mm. If you want an unpacking of it behind there to validate what you're probably feeling, which is no, everything's not all right. All you have to do is investigate debt a little more. Yes. I've, I've heard a lot. <laughs> I've heard, I've heard some scary things about debt. I must say some, uh, some degrowth scholars are talking about how, um, basically how interest and basically how it's going to, Constantly expand and expand, expand. Yeah, well, um, but I, I, well, I, I, let's I, not even let's not even jump to there. Let's just start with Australia and what's happening right now here. Sure. Six weeks ago, a report named that Australians were the wealthiest per capita individuals on average in the world. Mm -hmm. Let's just let that sink in sure. a second, right? Yeah, yeah. Wealthiest nation in the world per capita. Yeah. Largely because of inflated house prices. Yes. Yeah, okay. of course. At the same time, at the same time, Australian household debt per capita is the highest in the world. Mm. Just mm. let's pause even for the listeners yeah. to take this in. Mm. Wealthiest in the world, highest levels of household debt. Mm. You could hear one side of that story and be then saying, then why am I feeling not so good? Why is it doesn't feel everything's great? We're the wealthiest country in the world. Or you could go the other side and go, we're the wealthiest country in the world, and if this is as good as it can, like if we're the wealthiest, other places must be worse. So that, that could go in certain directions. Or the other side of it is, we're the wealthiest, and I'm underwater with this mm. mortgage that I have, or this car loan, or these student loans, etc. Yeah. right? Or this yeah. business loan. So there's a story that hasn't been told that, we have a, about $140 trillion of, of money in the global money supply, and we've got over $300 trillion of debt. Mm. That's baked in. That difference that's actually continuing to split yeah. is baked into capitalism. Yeah. yeah. And that's the jagged line that, that people draw. Yeah. Yeah. What, what I can't really... What I get a bit confused with, and this is speaking as a, you know, pretty much um, I'm about to graduate, as uh, someone studying finance, is that... Th these uh, ideas of uh, debt 
uh, uh, growing and growing and eventually may reach a certain tipping point. I mean, with global interest rates rising now, um, it's only going to be so long before... I mean, already people are probably maybe defaulting, defaulting yeah. um, because of global interest rates. But, but basically the whole narrative around degrowth scholars' critique on debt, um, I find it confusing as a student because in, in universities and schools, uh, such, a, such a narrative isn't put forth. And I don't think there's a, uh, some sort of conspiratorial, like, you know, uh, universities are purposely doing this. I just think uh, it may be because there's not that critical post-growth lens that's being applied in universities. That's my sense. But what, what you, you could be right. However, in my experience, and in, in seeking to respect the work that many post-growth scholars and degrowth scholars have done in this space, but at the same time sort of seek to also add something new here, I don't feel that many scholars in the space actually understand aspects of the money system mm. that are central to what I'm talking about. Mm. I think they get caught up with compound interest and they get caught up with aspects of macroeconomics mm. that are a little bit of red herrings in the work that Jen Hinton and I did for many years. We, mm. we discovered that it was a lot simpler Sure. In capitalism, money concentrates because the more money you make, which is a, the basic premise of the, yep. the return on investments or why you'd start a business by yourself, etc., if you're seeking mm. to scale it larger, um, the more money accumulates in bank accounts of the, of the wealthiest individuals and corporations, mm. the more debt has to be held elsewhere. Mm. That's just the mathematical equation given money is loaned into existence. Mm. Where a lot of scholars confuse a lot of people, and we're not at the moment, obviously, going through the step-by-step. Sure, so sure. tell me if any of this is, yeah, yeah, is no, confusing. Ahead. Where scholars get, get confused is that there is a... And groups like Positive Money that have done a lot of good have also, I think, confused people in terms of saying things like money is created by banks out of thin air. Mm. Well, yes, but that's an incomplete statement in terms of doing service to people who are listening. When money is created out of thin air, so is debt. Right. You can't, banks don't just create money mm. by itself. They create money when they loan you something and they create the equivalent debt so that it balances out. Mm -hmm. So what happens is then there's a demonizing of the banking system yeah. that then fail, it shuts down the ability to imagine a banking system that didn't operate that way. And then yeah. you go into people supporting cryptocurrencies and yeah, all of these sure. alternatives that misses the point. Mm. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with central banks they're fantastic, in fact, in a not-for-profit system. There's mm. nothing wrong with banking. There's nothing wrong with money or, or even compound interest mm. if you have a system that inherently circulates money. Yeah. The problem is we have a capitalist system that inherently accumulates money, mm. and that means then the banking system, money, debt, mm -hmm. compound interest, fractional reserve banking all become problematic. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, this is something I've, I've observed whereby people may have a feeling of something, an intuition right. that's correct, but then, but then the conclusion the, they draw yes. is is uh, fallacious or maybe taking it a step too far or may result in sort of more polarizing arguments, you know, right. because yeah. because Donald Trump was voted, it's because X, Y, Z, as opposed right. to maybe more critical analysis, which would find something else or something on the similar, on the inverse. But yeah, yeah. and I mean, speaking of banking, there's a wonderful bank. And I mean, I say wonderful, I'm biased because I'm their customer. But Australia I, Bank? Yeah, Bank of Australia. A fantastic which, bank, yeah. Which is a mutual bank. Um, and I wouldn't... I, 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 as a finance student, I, I, this is not speaking as a finance student, this is just as a citizen. I feel really excited because they're a mutual bank and I didn't really know this until I did research, but perhaps you can dive into more of this because I know this, I think, revolves around the work you do for non-for-profits. Yes. Uh, and essentially every customer of Bank of Australia is a, is a part owner and they don't have shareholders. Yeah, and I would even go one step further in saying that their language that they've chosen there is technically inaccurate, but sure. purposeful. You're not even owners. You're stewards, essentially. There's mm -hmm. no... What does own, ownership is a bundle of rights that usually involves, uh, in most Western countries, the ability to then sell a share of that business. So mm -hmm. in any consumer cooperative or a mutual, you don't technically have owners... Um, because essentially what's the capital of that of that company? It's your deposits and then whatever has happened in terms of the profits that they've used to actually grow the business. Mm. 
do you actually, and, and we'd have to look at their bylaws to see this, sure. but do you actually own a piece of the infrastructure mm. of, of the Bank Australia branch, uh, mm. the Bank, uh, Bank of Australia branch? Probably if we look at the bylaws, it'll say there that if that company ever winds up, that it will need, the assets will need to be passed on to another equivalent not-for-profit. Sure. It's called yeah. a, a, uh, an asset lock. Yeah. So, and it's also interesting to me, I love uh, Bank of Australia, and it's interesting to me that they say on their website that they are the first not-for-profit bank. Mm. There have been hundreds and thousands yeah. of not-for-profit banks in yeah. Australia. In fact, all of the banks that they emerged from were credit unions, yeah. which are not-for-profit banks. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the language sometimes gets a little uh, um, used differently for different purposes. There's been a history of not-for-profit banking in Australia that goes mm. back a long way. Um, and, uh, and obviously this can lead into our conversations around not-for-profit, which is sure, yeah. a lot of my own interest. But yeah. yes, fantastic to see uh, yeah. banks like that growing. Yeah, for sure. And I suppose, I mean, we can um, we may as well uh, digress into this topic now because it's uh, what a lot of Postgraduate Institute does, I think, is about scholarship or research around not-for-profits, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, my, my sense as a customer of Bank of Australia is I, f I feel very reassured by business. And as a business student, that's not something I can say a lot of businesses, a lot of customers feel reassured yeah. by the businesses they're with because, uh, not because they're evil, but because they're driven by a certain incentive. They're compromised. Sure. They're compromised, yeah. Sure. In ways that Bank of Australia is not. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I think the if I was to put my devil advocate cap on, I mean, we spoke to um, one of our first guests was uh, Professor of Finance at London School of Business. And, you know, he had a lot of great things to say about the, the importance of uh, shareholder value, what the shareholder, uh, what the share price does for long-termism, because obviously it bakes into a company a need to do good. But obviously there's all the criticisms of that, which I'm sure you have quite a few of. But Yeah, I'm interested to hear how that obviously uh, bakes in the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the argument that he puts forward, and uh, or if I was to try and steal man his position, is essentially that... If your if your desire is to have uh, is to have as high a share price as possible, it's important that you make decisions that are in the long term interest of the company. Now, there's obviously many instances you know, where that's not quite you know, where you, I... you know the primary way that shareholder price increases is that they'll do share share buybacks, share buybacks right? Yeah. Like so, I mean, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah for it, sure. you know, or or they will incentivize. Um, the executive pay mm. to actually say, look, your share price, your pay will be mm. related to your share price. And so yeah. then that's, it's a recipe for cutting corners. Like yeah. if I can lay off a, a thousand staff and it's going to increase my share price because we're going to get a better um, dividend ratio, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. then how's that in the long-term interest of the company? Yeah, yeah, no, no. There's definitely some very valid critiques, which um, I, I would like to explore with him. But I mean, getting back onto this, uh, this essence of when you're if you if you're if a business has the best interests of its customer, it makes sense to put customer first in the truest sense, which is to have in incentives that are aligned with uh, protecting customer or at least maybe not protecting customers, but having their best interests in mind. So I mean, so, in a mutual yeah. bank, it is having customer yeah. be the center. What can you tell us about the increasing uh, role that non for profits are playing in yeah, your view yeah, of their value in society? Well, yeah, and, and, and to highlight, not for-profit businesses have been around for centuries. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about four different kinds of not-for-profit business. So you have non-profit organisations that have business models underneath them. Um, so, for example, um, like where, where Mozilla Firefox is an mm -hmm. example of that. Yep. You actually have a not-for-profit uh, that has a business model. Where I have been living in the U.S., you have the Shakespeare Festival, um, mm. which is a, a, an arts organization. The majority of, it of its uh, income comes from its own revenue. The world's largest NGO, uh, BRAC, in, in Bangladesh, almost a billion dollars of, of income. Um, and, and let's just highlight this. This is a non-profit organization working in healthcare, education, mm. throughout 10 countries, uh, yeah. And you'd think, like, where does a non-profit non organisation like that get its funding? More than 80% of it is from running its own businesses, craft stores, bakeries, 
financial institutions, an artificial insemination research laboratory, all of these mm -hmm. business activities uh, that totally blow out of the water this idea of non-profit as a charity. Mm -hmm. um, most non-profits around the world generate more than 50% of their revenue. Mm -hmm. We're inside a non-profit institution right now. Yeah. The university that uh, essentially runs as a business. Yeah. Um, so that's one type. Then you have foundation-owned businesses like Patagonia recently mm. that, that switched over, like uh, IKEA, like Bosch, like the Guardian newspaper, these companies oh, wow, that okay, are owned yeah. by foundations without any shareholders. Then you have um, government enterprises. So Australia Post here, for mm. example, is a not-for-profit business. It's owned mm. by the Australian government. Um, you have, uh, lastly, consumer cooperatives. Mm. Um, Barcelona Football Club, for example. Is that a consumer cooperative? Yeah. yeah, consumer cooperative, Bank of Australia. Yeah. Um, combined, these forms of businesses uh, make up almost 20% of global GDP. Almost That's crazy. I mean, I'd, I just finished it's my a, degree. I've never learned that. It's a story that just doesn't get told because... So few people have looked at this distinction between for-profit and not-for-profit. Yeah. And so many people in social enterprise or purpose-driven business or B Corp spaces mm. will say, that's not the important piece. Whether you do profit or like, and yes, it is the important piece because it's the difference between drawing a circle or the jagged line. Mm. What one model circulates profit, the other one extracts it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And... Um, I mean, I, I keep coming back. So there's this idea that I've, I've sort of come across. Well, I come across this term and this idea that uh, is put forward by a professor, Gordon Menzies. He's a professor here, an economist who uh, his, his view is to humanize econo economics. And um, he did this paper, which was really interesting, where essentially he uh, looked at different industries uh, uh, and he got uh, essentially a sample of from each industry of professionals to play a game, a toy and crossing game. And uh, they would instruct each participant in this each sample group to flip a coin 10 times. And the more times you get heads or tails, the more money you get. So if you get like 10 heads, you get like $100. If you get five, you get 50. So they did this with each sample group. And essentially what ended up happening was uh, when you when you primed the participants that when you primed a specific set of participants uh, with questions regarding home life, what they care about, what they're passionate about, what values they have, and then you get them to play the game, they will be more honest compared to if you ask them questions about professionalism, how much money do you make, what are your career objectives, and the results were particularly, uh, were particularly enhanced within the business finance sector. So... Basically, their hypothesis or their their sort of analysis is business, finance, professionals have their incentives basically skewed and compromised so. and it will lead them to lie to make a bit of money. And you could draw whatever conclusions from that in terms of how they deal with customers, money, etc., etc. But uh, this idea that... Uh, that it, Values, ethics, morals, what people care about, is I think is something you can't quantify, and it's that, that feeling that you're having, right? If you that experiment you do with people during the future and the present, how does it, both of them make you feel? I think the traditional neoliberal, business-dominated language is to, if anyone brings up this idea of you know, feelings, people say, well, what is the return on that? Like, what is the numbers? What tell me? tell me what the numbers are, and it's this idea of the tyranny of numbers. This is sort of my my, uh, my hypothesis, is that we're sort of ruled by this uh, numbers-oriented, uh, well, we're, we're rather than feelings-oriented, yeah, which are right. really important, right? I mean... Of course, we're in a patriarchal system that values intellectualism and disconnected, head-based, rash, so-called rational mm. analysis, and in reality, that's only half of our experience there's the embodied connected mm -hmm. deeper um, wisdom where we're perceiving things as well mm -hmm. as thinking through things uh, all of the look it's only a matter of time before more and more of the um, the neuro uh, scientific community um, 
recognizes the the value of exploring these things in more holistic ways mm. from a space of embodied connected experience and mm. you know, of course the research is showing uh, the amount of equivalent brain cells in the heart all of these things that that allow us to realize that we are feeling individuals mm. primarily first and foremost and then thinking individuals secondarily mm. this is like the the reactive space from things that we sense before we even know i mean this I, I call myself an intuitive economist sometimes because mm. i'm seeking to encourage people including myself to be more intuitive about what's going on what do we mm. feel what do we intuitively feel is happening uh, so coming back to the people who are working in their um their officers who are working in the finance sector, and as you said, there's this mm. compromise. I don't blame them for a second. Mm, they're, caught, yeah. they're caught in a system in which they're compromised from the start. Yeah, in in a sense, they're probably they are playing the games of the playing the they are playing by the rules of the game exactly. in the best possible sense. Exactly. And it's not necessarily a value judgment. It's to say you're playing a game really well, but it's not it's not a, a question of. Uh, are these people uh, uh, inherently worse right. off? It is, what is right. this overall system? And that's what you were saying, a systems feeling, that's applying that systems thinking model of, okay, what game do we want to play? Yeah. I suppose that's the exercise that yeah. you were demonstrating at the, the beginning of the, at the beginning of uh, our good uh, conversation. Indeed, indeed. Um, so I, I, I want to come back to the 20% of, co- uh, of business being mutual. Uh, 20% of global 20, GDP. 20% yeah. of global GDP. Coming from not for not for profit forms of business. Sure, sure. So, I mean, I we talked very briefly about storytelling. Mm-hmm. What what stories do you think we need to tell about yeah. business? Like, because well, this, let, this let me let like, me tell you a story about okay, okay. Uh, how I discovered this. Okay. I was it was two thousand and nine. Mm-hmm. I was in business, uh, Brisbane for a community development conference. Mm-hmm. Keynote speaker Colin Saltmere, uh, an indigenous man, got up and spoke about Mayuma, his engineering and uh, engineering firm, mm. uh, civil and construction engineering. Uh, Fifty employees, twelve billion dollar turnover at the time, and then he said the words that changed the course of my life. He said, mm. "And we're a not for profit." <laughs> but now, yeah. now this is an engineering company. Yeah, yeah. What are they doing? I said to him, I went up to him after, I said, what do you mean you're not for profit? He said, well, um, you know, us mob, we don't, we're not here to make, get rich out of this. Mm. We're here to do something good. It's not like, that doesn't fit with our values. So we just all chipped in money at the beginning to have the startup capital. We loaned Mm. it in, right? You can loan to not for profits. Mm. Um, They can take out loans and bonds and all sorts of things. And, uh, and then got it started and then, got repaid our loans and it was off and running as a not-for-profit business. So mm. that then helped me recognize I'd been working for Lifeline, Vinnie's, Fred Hollows Foundation. They all have business models. Fred Hollows Foundation has uh, lens factories in mm. Eritrea and Nepal that are generating profit mm. that goes back into reducing the costs of, uh, of the medical services. Lifeline and, and St. Vincent de Paul both have uh, op shops. Right, selling things to offset their costs. So mm. there's business models that sit underneath not-for-profits all around the world. In fact, many non-profit organizations went into business over the last 30, 40 mm. years tired of being beholden to the whims of changing ideologies, political parties, etc. Uh, philanthropic you know, shifts uh, away from, from supporting them. So they just went into business. Mm. And they compete. And you'd be surprised... If you, if you went down the street and you looked around, not just at the shop fronts, but like the infrastructure and things like that, mm. you'd realize, oh, this is actually owned by the state government. Oh, this, yeah. this electrification system. Or, oh, wow, that's interesting. That healthcare system is actually a consumer cooperative model. Or, mm. oh, I'm getting my internet through, as I said before, Mozilla mm. Firefox. I use them as a browser. Oh, that's actually a not-for-profit. Mm. Interesting. You know, all of these things that we don't know about mm. uh, because they don't proclaim a lot of them mm. that we are a not-for-profit. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I would I would be willing to put my money on it, but I don't think any uh, non-for-profit, and I'm, I'm putting myself, uh, yeah. making myself maybe look a bit silly, but I don't think any non-for-profit would, would have a history of 
compromising itself for some sort of external gain in uh, terms there, of there, unethical practices? There, there's de- I mean, there's definitely not-for-profits that that fall into that category. I mean, sure. it's not immune. It's not the it's not the perfect model. Sure. What we focus on primarily is what it does with the money um, sure. in our system and what that means in terms of debt. Yep. Uh, the ability for debt to not have to keep expanding. Um, but no, you've got ethical uh, dilemmas and sure. scandals and things that happen. Just because you apply a business model doesn't mean that... Sure. That but yeah. it reduces it because there's more accountability then to... If you're running a business, if your model is business rather than philanthropy primarily, then you've got to be satisfying a lot more people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think what I mean by that is more uh, more blatant misalignment of... It's okay. harder. Okay. It's it's definitely harder. But there are um, examples. I mean, IKEA, for example, that I mentioned earlier, um, has some significant ethical problems uh, in Eastern Europe with how it sources wood. Mm. A lot of, of, of things that it's been uh, yeah. really tackled with. Mm. REI, which is a yeah. five million person consumer cooperative in, yeah. in the US, is getting a lot of criticism at the moment about pushing credit cards amongst mm. its members. So it's not immune. Um, yeah. But it's certainly... If you, if you compared that, like imagine UTS, the, the building yeah. we're in right now, the University of Technology, Sydney. It's a not-for-profit business. If it were a for-profit, mm. which in the US could be, you know, is quite, po- uh, quite prevalent and mm. in Australia is increasingly prevalent. Um, if it were, like I think Torrens University, for example, sure. is a for-profit. If UTS were a for-profit business, I bet you that there would be more... I bet you there'd be higher fees for starters. Absolutely. And I bet you that there would be a lot more compromises being made and less emphasis on sustainability, social justice, etc. Mm. So I remember sitting down with the the most telling story I have is I was at an event with the IKEA, the, some of the senior leaders in IKEA's sustainability team, and I sat down at the table with three of them. They didn't know who I was or any of my work in not-for-profit business. Mm. And I said, could I ask you a question without me telling you who I am? Uh, Mm. And they said, okay. I said, have you all worked, two questions, have you all worked at for-profit sustainability organizations before IKEA? And they said, yes, we all have. I said, could you tell me what's it like to work at a not-for-profit business versus a for-profit in terms of how you approach Mm. sustainability? Mm. And without even blinking, they all said, It's amazing. We come into work and we can actually do our jobs Mm. of thinking how to be innovative around sustainability, whereas at our previous jobs, we had to come in and cost something out and then talk about sustainability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it flips flips that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it brings to centre stage what is really important. Um, And a similar criticism I I have for... uh, for companies that are, so I, I currently work for Philips and they're doing really good stuff globally for um, net zero in terms of making sure that all their offices are offset or at least using sustainable energy. Um, but I think like a lot of product companies, uh, circular economy is something that's really important because you need to, re- need to recycle products. And at the same time, if your objective is to constantly grow, your material extraction will consider it will always increase and it's going to keep increasing and I don't think you can recycle I think in Australia we only recycle about 10 or 11 percent of our waste meaning to say no matter how good you're able to no matter how well you're able to recycle most things if you're constantly growing it's gonna that all that recycled material is going to be offset by the amount you're producing or continuing producing and if you were to shift that model at least Focus on things that are, you know, maybe more post-growth oriented or at least taking a critical lens of what circular economy does. And I'm sure there's some really uh, valuable stuff that circular economy is doing. But if you provide that different lens, it really allows you to break free of assumptions. Well, let's let's take a, a different lens here because I, I think you're right that there are limits to what circular economy can mm. do within a capitalist system, mm. you know, Australia might be at 10 or 11%, the world's at 9% and yeah. actually just went backwards. Yeah. Um, we're so far from recycling being anything really yeah. saving the world, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there's a story underneath what you just described that hasn't been told much. Mm. It's not so much the consumption and production that Philips is driving. Mm. 
so much as, and this is like really crucial to, I'm going to even slow down here for myself to just keep reminding myself, mm. that like, there's a bigger <laughs> story here. It's what happens with the profits that Phillips makes that then means that money goes into either Phillips' bank account or the shareholder bank accounts and doesn't get reinvested, just accumulate. Some of it might get reinvested, but more keeps accumulating. Let, let's just do a thought experiment here. Yeah. Let's say that I am Phillips' sole shareholder. Mm. Mm. Phillips makes $100 million profit in Australia in a year. Mm. It uh, retains $20 million of that profit as the mm. company. It decides it wants to, we want to reinvest in the company. I take $80 million. Mm. I reinvest in other areas uh, $60 million and I put $20 million into my bank account as cash. Mm. That now means that somewhere in the world there has to be at least $20 million of debt because remember, money and debt enter the system at the same time mm. uh, when money is loaned into existence. Mm. So I'm accumulating the profit from Phillips and I'm holding on to some of it. I'm not releasing that money into the system which means yeah. people indebted or governments or companies indebted can't access the money mm. that I'm holding on to. Mm. What do they have to do then? They have to go into more debt in order to survive because there's not access to the money. Yep. What's happening then is inequality is growing. So Phillips is doing more circular economy, blah, blah, blah. But in the meantime, inequality is growing, which means that emulative consumption is actually the bigger piece because mm. I'm here going, here's the narrative of what good life looks like. It's the Phillips executive who's living on the northern beaches with his yacht, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. with the advertising agency then building on all of that. And you need this, you need this, you need the latest Tesla, you need this. So it doesn't matter now what's happening with this narrative with Phillips if this division is growing and that's what underpins capitalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not many post-growth, degrowth folks We'll talk about that. They'll focus on production, consumption, etc. And most environmentalists will talk about reducing consumption. Absolutely. That's at the end of the day, we need mm -hmm. reductions in consumption that allow us to live one planet lifestyles. Yeah. But how we get there has to have at the center the acupuncture point and the key piece around mm -hmm. looking at inequality yeah. and understanding that capitalism has inequality baked into its yep. DNA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's almost a uh... I mean, uh, even ideas, philosophies that are within within capitalism, so meritocracy is one of them. And there's a really good book by Michael Sandel, who's a professor at Harvard, and he talks about the tyranny of merit. But basically, even philosophies like merit are not a... Uh, uh, they are a justification of inequality. They are a justification of inequality, you're absolutely right. And that's not to say that meritocracy is inherently a bad thing, it's just to say that uh, even the philosophies that develop within a system, within a game, are derived because of that game itself. And so different philosophies have to be told. Yeah, meritocracy is a self-serving philosophy in a capitalist system. Sure. Yeah, it absolutely, absolutely maintains the, the mm. dominant narrative. Absolutely. So now I, I know we're, we're pressed for time, so I'll, I'll have to accelerate. I, I'll, two more questions. So the, the first one is, obviously, you know, we've been... Uh, talking about the importance of non-for-profits and their increasing role in society and perhaps uh, they, they ought to have a bigger role. Um, do you see a role for for-profit businesses in, in the long term? Uh, let's say there's a utopia. Our sure. channel is called Utopias now, so yeah. I'll get you to imagine some sort of yeah. some place. Uh, let's say, you know, 100, 200 years in the future. Should or, or for-profit companies exist is there a place for them so let's say let's take phillips sure. right for profit sure. company at the moment yeah very clear i'm not i'm not speaking on behalf of Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> of let's take let's take an electrical uh um yeah you know, uh, i don't know if you call it electrical engineering electrical uh goods and services sure sure yeah business, yeah. Right? yeah um well what would happen if a foundation just came in and bought out of all of phillips shares but kept it as a separate entity mm -hmm. It would still be a for-profit company mm. that was owned by a not-for-profit parent company. Sure. That's fine. Mm. That means that all the profit is then going over to a foundation, for example, that's doing that. That's what, essentially, that's what's happened with Patagonia. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in as much as for-profit companies acting as subsidiaries of mm. not-for-profits, 
or hybrid businesses in the transition where you know you get a joint ownership like you see that in in Sweden where the government will own the majority of of stock listed companies not just government enterprises but st- the government actually buys into stock listed companies mm. and has the majority of that company if 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 that's part of the transition that makes a lot of sense to me in terms of the future no the, the, i i imagine a, a vision of the future where it's not competitive to be a for profit company that you can't you get if you mm. if you proposed i want to have a for profit company incorporated at the incorporation level versus just like a small business that's unincorporated or mom sure. and pop store that's essentially legally for profit in terms of you your own the mm. profit goes back to you but at the incorporation level when it gets to a certain size no I, i imagine that there would be a i hope there will be a social understanding and and somewhat of a stigma mm. about setting up a business that was in the notion of private uh, private gain of a certain size but that's just wishful thinking the other side of it is i imagine a future where it's just not competitive to be mm. in that space why because the tax exemptions are for the not for profit businesses the fact mm. that you don't have shareholders means you've got uh less dividends that you're potentially paying out mm-hmm. you know all of these things that the creative talent uh continues to move towards businesses that say we are for purpose mm-hmm. um so so that's the the future i imagine i don't think we're going to get there in in time mm-hmm. to avoid uh ongoing collapse which we are in collapse mm-hmm. we have had forms of collapse cascading and increasing in the cascading for a long time mm-hmm. Um what I do think is that after a number of false starts, uh restarts so to speak that we will get to that post-capitalist market system. I think it's going to take another 40 50 years for people to really feel and to get that we can have a post-capitalist system mm. because a lot of people are still stuck in this notion left right sure. free market regulated market. Most of my post-growth and degrowth colleagues will probably suggest to you that the answer to moving forward is to tax the bads whether mm. that's tax the wealthy or tax some sort uh, of eco socialism so yeah some so- well eco socialism's a little different they will say that but what do they actually mean eco socialism fits with the agenda i'm describing in the sense of the of the technical definition of mm. socialism right which is about communal ownership yeah. of things what most people then hear then is national government ownership of things. Yeah, yeah. To me, the nationalization of of certain industries is part of the equation. Yeah. But I'm actually interested in a market economy where social services increase and government engagement uh, mm. and and control decreases. Mm. Which is an atypical position in in our yeah. space. I'm I am actually interested in greater local agency over centralized mm. government control of things. Uh and so that's where you can thread a needle that appeals to actually a lot of right wing um yeah. you know philosophy it's it's coming back full circle to those pieces from my dad's and my mom's yeah, influence yeah, yeah. and saying look it's not a great i i know lots of countries around the world where they are um where there's a lot more of the economy is not for profit but mm. it's government Saudi Arabia mm. the world's most profitable company Saudi Aramco mm. is a not for profit it's run by the saudi government it provides yeah. the majority of their budget it's not the vision of the future i have in terms of what that means for yeah. that government having control over mm. uh, all sorts of things but yeah. but it's part of the picture yeah yeah i mean that's a that's a pretty persuasive view i think you've sold me um but i to get a even greater encapsulated view and this can be our final question we ask all of our guests you know what would your utopia look like and obviously you've painted a interesting picture about uh the re- future role of non-for-profits and how they would perhaps be more competitive than traditional for-profit companies but obviously post-growth living is more in cap in cap shades a lot much, more things much. rather than non-for-profit business and obviously Absolutely. as a business student I'm, I'm biased towards my interests are biased towards non-for-profits but what does post-growth living look like what is your utopia for mm. for post-growth living it's slower it's where people have the space and time to connect in ways that are important to them with the things and people that are important to them it's where we are on a more daily basis able to live out the truth of what we're feeling rather than compromising 
it's where more of these things that we are talking about today are inherent in the system rather than mm. things we have to react to where we're more naturally like where you wake up and you're part of a system that is inherently oriented towards mm. doing good by uh, circulating when you circulate it's interesting when you circulate money um, then what happens is that power then circulates mm. you get a decentralization of, of power when yeah. money circulates when those things happen, you see more environmental circulation in terms of the resources being shared around mm. and less usage in terms of the pressures of a few individuals controlling narratives. Mm. So in that kind of world, you can imagine, like just imagine not-for-profit, uh, a not-for-profit economy. Well, what's all the advertising about? <laughs> it's essentially selling you <laughs> goods and services. It's goods and services <laughs> yeah. that are driven by purpose. Imagine, just imagine that world for a moment where you're not bombarded with advertising that's all about making you feel shit. Yeah. This is actually about advertising that's yeah. seeking to make you feel like really connect with feelings that are important. So, Manfred Max Neef's Universal Basic Needs, if anyone has, has read about those, it's a world in which those nine universal basic needs are really met. Uh, they're quite different to Maslow's hierarchy of sure. needs. And, yeah. and I think that's... That's the kind of world that's slower, more intentional, yeah. a world where we can actually love and be in love with all of the things around us yeah. and, and sensing in every step of, that we take what actually feels right for this circumstance. Mm. How do we support each other? How do we make good decisions mm. uh, from a space of, of connecting with that wisdom deep inside us that drew the circle yeah. uh, and, drew the, and knew that we needed to get there compared to the jagged line? Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think that's the best place to wrap it up. Thank you, Donnie, for appearing on the podcast. And hopefully I get to interview you, have a conversation with you again sometime in the future. And again, thank you very much. Thanks, Al. Thanks.